What was at stake was the future of the information revolution. For 2,000 years, cryptography, the science of secrecy, has fundamentally affected the course of history. But even as recently as the late 1960s, every code ever devised, however complex, still suffered from one fatal flaw. The fundamental problem of cryptography can be explained like this. Now imagine I've got a highly secret note and I want to send it to a friend on the other side of the world. Now I'm worried that there's an interceptor, an eavesdropper, who's trying to get hold of the note, so I have to protect it. Now the way I'm going to protect it is by putting it inside a box. I close the lid and I padlock it shut. Now padlocking the box, putting the message inside the box, is just like encrypting it. It's another way of protecting the message. Now, at this point, I can safely send it on its way. However, there is a problem. I've still got the key. Now, the question is, how do I get the key to my friend without the eavesdropper getting hold of it? It's known as the key distribution problem, and it's the oldest, toughest problem in cryptography. In cryptography, the key is the special recipe for first scrambling and then unscrambling a secret message. By the 1960s, key distribution was costing a fortune. Banks, governments and big businesses literally paid heavily guarded couriers to travel around the world delivering encryption keys in person. And imagine going through this every time you want to send a personal email or buy something online. By the early 70s, it was clear that something had to be done. Martin Hellman and Whitfield Diffie, along with a third researcher, Ralph Merkel, were based in the Electrical Engineering Department at Stanford University in California. Unlike most cryptographers, they worked outside the secretive world of military intelligence. I've been thinking about key distribution since 1965. The fundamental problem, there were several, but one of the critical ones, we didn't, in the public world, know very much about cryptography at all. And people were afraid to try to learn. I, I'm sure you got the same argument I did from my colleagues when I'd start to tell them I was getting interested in cryptography. They'd tell me, you're crazy. Instead of it scaring me off, it actually goaded me on, if anything, kind of like, I'll show them. In the spring of 1975, after months of getting nowhere, Diffie and Hellman made an unexpected breakthrough. I got up and I walked downstairs to get myself a Coke. And as I got to the bottom of the stairs, I was thinking, my, I was thinking something interesting, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I almost lost it. And then it came back to me, and from then on, I managed to hold on to it. Diffie and Hellman had come up with an idea that turned cryptography on its head. For 2,000 years, the sender of a secret message had taken the responsibility for encryption. Now, what Diffie and Hellman were proposing was that the receiver should take responsibility for encryption. So I'd start by asking the receiver to send me his padlock. And I then use his padlock to lock up my message. This whole system works because what we're doing here is exchanging padlocks, not keys. The key was always with the receiver, so there was no risk of the key falling into the wrong hands. Three, seven, nine, three, four, one, two, three, eight, four, two, three, 
because the language of computers is numerical, Diffie and Hellman couldn't use a real padlock, instead they had to find a mathematical padlock. Now a padlock is easy to snap shut, but hard to open. Easy to do in one direction, but hard to reverse. Similarly, a mathematical padlock is an operation that's easy to do in one direction, but hard to reverse. Now, looking for a mathematical padlock is far from trivial, and that's because most mathematical operations are easy to do in one direction and just as easy to do in the opposite direction. For example, doubling. I could give you a number, say 24, and ask you to double it, and you could tell me that the answer is 48. But I could have given you 48 and asked you to halve it, and you could have just as easily told me that the answer was 24. So doubling is not a mathematical padlock. It's what we might call a two-way operation, as opposed to a one-way operation. A good example of a one-way operation is multiplication. I can easily multiply two four-digit numbers together, and it should take me less than a minute. But if I gave you the answer and asked you to work backwards, well, that's a much, much, much harder problem. For example, if I gave you the number 7,837,449,989 and asked you which two numbers must you multiply together to get that number, well, where do you start? In fact, there's only one combination of numbers which will give me that result. But finding those two numbers would mean having to try thousands of different options in order to find the right one. And that could take me all day. In short, multiplying is easy. Going backwards, which is known as factoring, is a mathematical nightmare. So multiplying two large numbers is the mathematical equivalent of a lock. But it's a lock without a key. Now the search was on for an operation that was irreversible unless you had the mathematical equivalent of a key. And finding this was to prove fiendishly difficult. The first ones I came up with didn't work. There were things involving, um, involving matrix multiplications and uh, some schemes involving exponentiation. And none of the early ones actually worked. They're very rare beasts. God didn't make very many of them. What's hard in the public key system is a public key system is only apparently one way. It's a trapdoor one-way function. It's easy to go one direction, and it appears impossible to go backward uh, to anyone who doesn't have the secret key. But if you have that secret key, the trapdoor information, then you can easily do what no one else can, can do. That, that's what's hard to find. By 1975, Diffie and Hellman had come up with a potential solution to the key distribution problem. But they lacked the specialist mathematical knowledge needed to make it work. It was one of the most radical ideas of the 20th century, but Diffie and Hellman were unable to bring it to fruition. Little did Diffie and Hellman know, but somebody else was also working on the key distribution problem. Behind the closed doors of the top secret British government communications headquarters, GCHQ in Cheltenham, there was a specialist department called the Communications Electronic Security Group, CESG, which had already spent years trying to find a solution. Back in 1969, one of the British government's foremost cryptographers, James Ellis, had come up with exactly the same idea as Diffie and Hellman, except that he was five years ahead of them. Having also conceived of the idea of a mathematical padlock, he and everyone else in British intelligence were then unable to make it work. Until 1973, that is, when a 22-year-old mathematical genius 
fresh out of Oxford University, join the team.